This is Software Engineering Radio, the podcast for professional developers on the web at se-radio.net. SE Radio is brought to you by the IEEE Computer Society and by IEEE Software Magazine. Online at computer.org slash software. Need a helping hand with your system's architecture? Software Mill will help you design high-throughput backends and event-driven solutions. We're a brand trusted by businesses and valued by employees due to our remote-first, transparent organization, which gives back to the IT community through education and open source. Have an idea? Let's code together. Meet our Scala, Java, Kafka, and TypeScript engineers at softwaremill.com today. For Software Engineering Radio, this is Robert Blumen. I have with me Doug Foley. Doug is a software engineer at Google, where he is the tech lead for gRPC. He's active in the open source community relating to gRPC and distributed systems and is a graduate of Carnegie Mellon University. Doug and I will be talking about gRPC. Doug, welcome to Software Engineering Radio. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Robert. It's great to have you. gRPC, let's start out with what does it stand for? Okay, sure. So the RPC part stands for Remote Procedure Call, which is essentially a way of saying that a process on one computer is able to make a remote call to another piece of software running on another computer. The G part of gRPC is actually there is no formal definition for what it means. So it's a little bit of a gimmick. Uh, every time we do a release, we will choose a different a different name that it stands for. So like the version. 1.0 release, the G and gRPC stood for gRPC. One might have guessed it stood for Google, but that's not the case. Right. No, that's, that's not the case. That is a pretty uh, easy assumption to make. But no, uh, even though it was started by Google, gRPC uh, was contributed to the CNCF. And so it is not actually owned by Google. I want to focus on the RPC part for a bit, and then we'll talk more specifically about what makes gRPC different. Why would an application want to make an RPC? The most typical reason why you'd want to use RPCs is if uh, you had sort of a microservice architecture for your, for your application. So uh, the way that would work is uh, you sort of break break up your application into smaller pieces that each perform uh, different tasks. And then these would run like in a cloud-like environment. And then the RPCs would enable these different components to communicate. Programmers who listen to this in our audience are familiar with procedure calls. You can hardly write a program without knowing what a procedure call is. What are the major differences between a procedure call you make within the same programming language and a remote procedure call? So I think the biggest difference there would be just the fact that if you're running on a remote system, there's an extra you know, component of the network in the way. And so uh, networks being what they are, you could potentially experience a loss of connection. And so you have to be tolerant of that happening. Whereas, you know, if you're running on the local machine, there's no way that you can disconnect from yourself. So there are more failure modes that can occur in an RPC, whereas a local procedure call doesn't get lost on the way. Exactly. Yeah. So there's, there's an extra level of complexity there. Also, just being remote means you need some extra components in the system because just to discover the, the destination for your RPC means you need to do some kind of name resolution to look up the service that you want to talk to. And then you also have other concerns. Uh, since you have potentially many different clients and many different servers, you want to make sure you're doing the right kind of uh, load balancing so that you don't have too many clients hitting a single backend server. And also you want to make sure that you have you know, fault tolerance built in so that if uh, your server goes down, that your client has backups that it can talk to. So yeah, none of these would apply really if you're on the same system. I understand many RPC packages work roughly the same way. Could you describe the generic RPC framework focusing on common features? Most commonly, I think you're going to see a way for a client to connect to a server and to send a single RPC that would consist of a single request 
and the response from the server would be a single response. That's sort of like your baseline functionality. There are other cases where you can potentially do streaming RPCs, which gRPC supports. So the client and the server are both able to freely send messages back and forth. But yeah, that's, that's the basics. I want to go a bit more into streaming later. Let's come back to that. Now, focusing more on gRPC, Google had multiple generations of internal RPCs of which gRPC is the latest one. How were the previous generations unsatisfactory or what made it possible and, and why was gRPC created? Yeah, that's a great question. So yeah, Google has gone through a number of iterations here. And I think in terms of uh, limitations, uh, really, I think the what Google had as its latest generation was probably acceptable in terms of features provided. However, the way that it was implemented was uh, directly on top of TCP, and it involved, you know, a lot of a lot of code in order to support things that gRPC gets natively through the advantage of some advances that have been made in uh, open source technologies. So, for instance, HTTP two. And so, when you look at a technology like Stubby, which Google uses internally. It has all the features of gRPC, and so gRPC isn't necessarily superior because of the features it offers, but it is much more easily brought to an open source world. It doesn't need to handle all the streaming cases that Stubby handles on its own, and also it doesn't rely on any other internal Google libraries that would have made Stubby a lot more difficult to open source. I understand gRPC; it's leveraging a considerable amount of features that are built into HTTP2 and gets a lot, a lot of benefit from that. Can you go a bit more into what HTTP2 does and what does gRPC derive from being a layer on top of that? So HTTP2 actually does the bulk of the work for gRPC. gRPC is essentially a fairly thin wrapper on top of it to um, encode the protocol for gRPC. What HTTP2 brings is a basic transport layer that is used by gRPC. And the features that it has that are sort of novel versus HTTP1 are stream multiplexing. So the ability to have multiple streams or communications happening at the same time on a single connection. And also they provide a flow control mechanism for managing that. So if a gRPC client is talking to some kind of backend and it has multiple threads that are all doing one or more RPCs to the same backend, then can they all share the same HTTP2 connection? Yes, that's right. You only need one connection. And the streams are also all bidirectional, meaning the client and server are free to send messages at any time. And so flow control. So go a bit more into the flow control. First, start at what, what is flow control? So flow control is a part of HTTP2 that is designed to prevent a server from receiving more data than it's ready to handle and needing to buffer it. So if you think of like a bunch of RPCs happening at the same time, let's say your server application is busy processing one, but your client continues to send messages to the server, not knowing that the server is busy. Flow control is that way for the server to push back and say, wait, don't send anything else on this stream. I can't handle it right now. I'm busy processing the last message you sent. And the, the other uh, benefit that that has is it can block one stream, but the other RPCs that are happening on other streams are allowed to continue uh, because maybe those aren't stuck because they have different resources behind them. When you're describing it, it's a way to prevent resources from becoming saturated. Is that more or less correct? Yeah, that's right. It's, it's there to protect the server from becoming overloaded. And there's something called head of line blocking. Now, is that what you're talking about or is that something different? So head of line blocking, I think you can run into some similar issues with flow control if not managed correctly. But yeah, so head of line blocking, I think was a HTTP one problem where a single uh, request at a time could happen on an HTTP one connection. This meant that if you needed to request multiple resources, 
then you would have to request one, wait to get it back, and then request the next one. And so the HTTP2 model of uh, having multiple streams at a time sort of gets around that because now you can make multiple requests and then wait for the responses to come back in whatever order they're ready. I think you touched on this in my reading about HTTP2 or gRPC. I need to clarify if this is a HTTP2 or gRPC feature. There are three connection options, unary, client-side streaming, and server-side streaming. What do those mean? Okay, so a unary RPC is where a client will communicate with a server. So in all of these models, the client initiates the RPC. And so in a unary RPC, the client will send a single request and the server will process that, do what it needs to do and respond with a single response. Uh, so that is your, your unary RPC mode. This is you know, the most typical way of thinking about RPCs. And then there are different streaming options, but they all sort of boil down to the same thing in terms of you know, what it means to uh, the gRPC library. But for a user, we expose three concepts. We have a client stream, a server stream and a bi-directional stream. And so in server streaming, this means that when the client starts the RPC, it sends one request just as it did in the unary case, but the server will respond with potentially many different messages. Um, and so it can do this over the course of you know, a few seconds or even hours or days potentially. And so places where you might use this are like if the client wanted to do a database query, uh, it might send the query, you know, it can do that in a single short message, but the server needing to uh, return potentially many, many, many rows worth of data, instead of bundling those up into one huge unit and sending them all together, it could stream the results one at a time. And that would also give the client the capability to, you know, stop the RPC in the middle and say, okay, that I got what I needed. Uh, and ended early. So the server didn't need to spend more resources than it needed to uh, in order to handle that. Uh, so that's server streaming. Then there's client streaming, which is the same in reverse, where the client will send uh, many messages to the server. The server will wait until all of those are received. It will process it however it needs to, and then it will respond with a single, a single message. So an example of where you might use this would be uh, like if you wanted to upload a file, from the client to the server, then the client might chunk it up into many smaller pieces. And at the end, the server says, okay, yes, I got it. Maybe here's the checksum, something like that. The last case is bi-directional streaming. And this is where the client and server both interchange messages asynchronously on both sides. And so here, an example of when you might use this is a PubSub application where the client wants to subscribe to a topic and then the server needs to send messages back for that topic, but the client could potentially subscribe to other topics or you know, it needs the capability of signaling, you know, ACK, I, I have processed this message on this topic, things like that. So there's, there's asynchronous communication happening continuously from both sides. Are these then the next generation of what was formerly solved with things like long polling? You can definitely uh, handle that for like the server side streaming case would be a way to, to do essentially a long poll with gRPC. Would another use case of this be financial market data where price ticks are coming in and uh, users seeing updated charts or price data? Yeah, sure. That, that would work great for this. So you, you can get that data up, updated you know, asynchronously as it happens. And does this work for things like voice? listening to music or video streaming? It's definitely not designed for that. There's no limit in terms of what type of data you can send, you know, with appropriate buffering, maybe that would work, but this isn't, you know, designed for streaming. I am vaguely aware a lot of that tends to use UDP and not wanting to incur the overhead of TCP and the retries. Right, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, in those applications, you're more tolerant of uh, data loss, whereas, you know, TCP and uh, HTTP2, you get like guaranteed delivery. And so, you know, you would potentially be needing to rebuffer a lot if you if you tried to use something like this for that. Are you aware of, have there been any layers built on top of gRPC that expose 
more of a pub sub abstraction, which is using gRPC as a transport, but as a programmer, you see it as pub sub. So Google has a pub sub uh, service that we offer in cloud. Uh, but yeah, in terms of just like a library on top of gRPC, uh, I don't think so. There are you know other things that a pub sub system needs besides just the transport layer. Uh, so really, you're looking at like a whole service. I think when you're talking about uh, doing pub sub, when we're talking about the the features provided by HTTP two, then is TLS one of those features that gRPC can use? So gRPC does use TLS. We do take advantage of it. The way that our architecture works, you can actually plug in any type of transport security. And that is negotiated at the beginning of every connection. And when the client and server then you know, finish that handshake, then what we talk over that encrypted connection is HTTP2, regardless of whether you're using TLS or something else. I did want to mention for our listeners, we had an episode on HTTP2, which is number 232. And I'll put that in the show notes where we covered that more in depth. Another feature of HTTP protocols is caching. Is gRPC able to take advantage of that? No, so gRPC doesn't currently uh, utilize any HTTP level caching. Uh, so anything that you wanted to cache like that, you would need to do on the application side. Okay, you mentioned part of the layering of the gRPC on that is not built into HTTP2 is the encoding. I'd like to go more into that. What is, let's start, what is the problem it's trying to solve with encoding? So encoding is essentially the process of taking data that you have represented in memory on the client and figuring out how to transmit that to the server application. So you know this is called serializing, typically. And so the process here is we need to be able to serialize your data to send it over the wire. And then on the receiving side, we need to be able to deserialize it and be able to you know, have it in the same form that it was at on the client. And how does gRPC do that? gRPC, typically you would use uh, protocol buffers with gRPC, which is a Google open source project. It is actually pluggable, so you can use any encoder that you want with your uh, data. And so we are completely agnostic to that, but sort of built into gRPC is proto support. So if I don't like protobufs, I could use Java serialization or anything I want. Uh huh, exactly. If you can turn your in memory data into a bunch of bytes and vice versa, then you can use it. Why does gRPC, why was protobuf selected? Uh, so protobuf is what we use internally at Google, and gRPC was started by Google engineers. So it was sort of a natural choice, but we also think that it's a really good choice. It is a language agnostic uh, IDL interface definition language that you can specify your protocol in. And once you've defined it in that form, now we offer a variety of compilers to turn that definition into something usable for many, many different languages. Plus just sort of the structure, it has everything that we need. It is what Google is using internally for uh, our own RPC system stubby. And so, you know, it already has the concept of services with methods and the messages that are sent on them. I believe we have an episode in development that will come out later this year on protobufs and some of the other packages in that space. So I wanted to focus a little bit on the language agnostic part. Does that mean I can call a gRPC from, for example, Java, and I could write the endpoint in Python or Ruby or, or whatever is the favorite programming language of the team that develops that backend? Yes, you can. So usually the way you would do that is the service owner would define their service. They would specify, this is the name of my service. These are the methods it exposes. And for these methods, here's the input, here's the output. So the service owner would define that, and then they would publish that in a protobuf definition file. And then any client written in any language could consume that turn it into a, a native language gRPC wrapper and use the library for their language in order to communicate with that service, no matter what the service was written in. Are there client libraries in JavaScript that can be used within a browser? 
So in JavaScript, uh, in the browser is sort of an interesting case. Uh, we do have uh, Node.js support, but that isn't you know, something that you could run in your web browser. So when you get to a web browser, there are some options if you want to use gRPC on your server. There is a project called gRPC Gateway, which is a, a community contribution that essentially turns your gRPC server into a REST endpoint that your web browser can access like it would access any other REST uh, with JSON endpoint. There is also a library that is more first party, and that one is called gRPC Web. And that does involve some JavaScript that runs in your browser that is able to make, I believe, only unary RPCs to your backend services because it doesn't really fully support HTTP2 right now. A while back, you said one of the main use cases for gRPC would be in a microservices architecture where you have microservices calling other microservices. It sounds like then what you're saying would be that state of the art might be the back end is communicating among itself with gRPC, but what gets exposed out to the browser is probably REST or HTTP one something. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's pretty typical. So yeah, if you wanted your services to be only gRPC, then you could use like a gRPC gateway to just be that translation right at the edge there. But yeah, you wouldn't usually talk gRPC directly to your web browser. As a developer, when I'm setting things up, I find it very convenient to use curl or postman to test out HTTP one applications. Is there a curl substitute? In the, H in the HTTP2 or gRPC world? So curl actually does support HTTP2. It gets a little tricky when you want to do things like streaming and you want to try to have an ongoing conversation with back and forth messages that way. But yeah, curl, curl does uh, work with HTTP2. But I, you could use curl, I guess, with a gRPC server because gRPC is using HTTP2. But you would need to be able to encode and decode the messages yourself, which is uh, pretty complicated. So instead, there are some applications out there. Uh, one is called gRP curl that can essentially provide a curl-like experience, but for gRPC services. I've been going down the trail asking you some follow-up questions, but if we pop back up to the protobufs, use the term IDL and protobuf definition file. Are those the same thing? Yes. So the protobuf uh, language itself, I guess, would be the IDL or the interface uh, definition language. So what you would produce as a user wanting to create a protobuf service is you would create a protobuf definition file that specifies your service uh, using protobuf. What is in this file? So essentially the contents are messages, which are blocks of data. Uh, and within your messages, you would have fields. And those could be string fields or integer fields or other messages, or you know there are maps and uh, arrays and things like that too. So that describes the data that's transmitted by your RPC system. Then we have services, which are collections of RPC endpoints provided by that service. And so the service is essentially a list of methods provided, and the methods are inputs and outputs in the form of messages. Hiring a software engineer? Then we recommend working with G2i. G2i is the most effective way to discover talented and pre-vetted engineers for every project. G2i vets their talent pool through technical interviews and various code challenges which are graded by actual engineers, saving you time and guaranteeing you top quality through their transparent grading. They specialize in React, React Native, and Node.js. Interested in learning more? Then go to g2i.co. Does the use of protobuf ensure strong typing? Yes, protobuf supports strong typing. Now, protobuf, as you described, it is an independent tool. If I'm just using protobuf by itself, then what do I do with this IDL? Yeah, um, you can use protobuf by itself for some other reasons besides RPCs if you wanted to. Um, the thing that wouldn't probably make sense is the services part. 
but the messages would still apply to you in any world. And so what the messages gives you is the ability to do that serialization and deserialization that we talked about earlier. And now you can convert you know, in-memory data into something that can be potentially written to disk or sent over the network in other ways, and then consumed later on a receiving side, potentially in a different language, as we, as we also mentioned. Yeah. Okay. What I'm trying to get at, so I'm, I'm doing something with Python. I have protobuf, I compile it down into Python, or what, what's the workflow, the developer workflow? Okay, right. So there is a uh, protobuf tool that ships with the main protobuf libraries that is called proto-c, and the c there stands for compiler. And essentially what that does is that parses the protobuf definition input, and it provides an intermediate output for a plugin to consume. That plugin is also provided by Google through the open source projects. And that plugin will convert that intermediate language into a native language specific wrapper that defines the types and um, those types of things uh, all locally for that language. So then you end up with like, for instance, a header file in C that defines your, your data structures. This could differ based on the language, because some languages support standalone interfaces and some don't. Are you then modifying generated code or are you just implementing some kind of interface that is defined in generated code? Yeah, so the way protobuf works is it generates the files and the user should not touch those except to regenerate them later in order to uh, pick up changes in the protobuf file. Everything else that's done is written on top of that. So for the data types, obviously, you just define your, you know, your uh, in-memory variable as of that data type, and you access it that way. For services, it's a little different, but typically there you're going to implement methods in order to satisfy an interface, and then uh, you will now have a service implementation that is compatible with gRPC. Okay, so you generate this code, you write a client to send the RPC serialize it through protobufs, sends it across the wire, other side deserializes and then dispatches it through this interface to the method you implemented that then receives the values in its own native types for that language. Is that pretty much how it goes? That's exactly right. And the important thing to note is that most of those steps you just said are handled by gRPC itself. And so the application doesn't have to worry about the serializing and the deserializing. If you wanted to use like a different plugin to do your serialization, you might need to do some extra work. But typically, if you use things out of the box, it becomes a very, very simple development process to start with gRPC you make your proto, you implement your interfaces, and then everything looks you know, very, very natural to your language, and you don't have to worry about a lot of those details. We discussed briefly JavaScript. What languages are well-supported and battle-hardened implementations? Yeah, so we have uh, native implementations of gRPC in C, Java, Go, and now uh, C Sharp.net implementation. But there are a lot of languages supported, and the way that works is by wrapping the C implementation. And so we have you know, C++, we have Python, Ruby, Objective-C, PHP. And I forgot to mention, uh, we now have a, a Node version of gRPC that is also native. Cool. We've now covered quite a bit about that protobuf. I want to move on talking more at that next level of the stack. In our earlier discussion about RPC and local procedure call being different, we were discussing the failure modes due to the network. With HTTP, you get a HTTP status code, which might be uh, 4XX or 5XX when something goes wrong. Does the client have any visibility into that HTTP status, or what does the client see when the method fails at the HTTP level? So in gRPC, we completely abstract away the uh, HTTP uh, transport details there. So the client wouldn't be able to get access to that. 
We would provide that in sort of a debugging way if something bad on the connection were to happen uh, like that. But typically, we, the application for gRPC would see gRPC status codes. And so if the connection dies, you might see unavailable, for instance, as a status code returned to you. So as a developer, uh, many applications do look at that status code either within the client or you have proxies that are going to retry on a 503, but not on a 404. Are you making uh, it more difficult for applications to take some reasonable steps based on the HTTP status value? No, we see it as trying to make the life of the developer easier because they don't have to think about those things. So we we will translate the HTTP status codes into something appropriate for the application that is speaking gRPC. And then, you know, if unavailable is something you would like to have your application retry on, then that that is something that you would do at that time. Knowing the exact HTTP2 error code shouldn't be required because we as the, you know, the ones using the transport should be handling that for the application. Can you route gRPC through HTTP proxies? Yeah, so any L7 HTTP2 proxy should work as long as you know, it preserves the semantics of HTTP2 correctly. And then also there are the you know, more TCP level proxies that will work because they just pass you know, arbitrary data through. Reading about this, I understand clients can use either a sync or async coding model. What do those look like? Yeah, this one depends on the language that you're implementing in. So for instance, Go, which is the language that I work on, there is uh, no asynchronous API for RPCs. Uh, everything in Go typically is blocking. And so that's the design model that we followed uh, with gRPC. But in languages where threading is more of a concern, asynchronous becomes very important. So C++ and Java need to go through some amount of extra effort in order to manage uh, the threads because you may potentially have you know, hundreds of threads available but thousands of RPCs that you want to be able to handle at any time. Uh, and so you need to be able to do that efficiently. So the way that you would do that is you would start an RPC and then you would provide a callback that gRPC would call when messages are received, for instance. For the developer toolkit, what are the, the command line tools or building blocks that gRPC provides what are the steps a developer goes through to get there to a uh, client and server up and running? Yeah, I mean, so the first thing you would do if you wanted to start from scratch on an RPC service is you would start at the protobuf level. You would make sure that you downloaded the uh, protoc tool, which is a command line binary for converting your protobuf into a language stub. And then you would also download the plugin for your language. You would define the protobuf definition for your service. You would run the protobuf compiler. That would produce uh, language bindings. Uh, now you're ready to develop your application. So you would, you would write your application using that library that was produced by the protobuf compiler. And then at that point, you would just compile it and run it, and everything should work. So managing complex distributed system due to client and server necessarily have to be deployed at the same time? Or is there some, if, if there are changes to the IDL, is there some ability for uh, servers to be forgiving of client version mismatches or vice versa? Right, yeah. So, so this is a really huge topic, actually. Um, you talk about wanting to make a change to your API. This is you know, something that needs to be done with a lot of consideration. Typically, the way this works is uh, you make sure that the changes you're making are backward compatible, meaning that if you have any existing clients in the world that are using an old version, but they're trying to talk to a server that's written with the new version, that things will continue to work for them as expected. So you can't do something, for instance, like delete a field if there might be a client out there using that field because now your servers wouldn't be able to handle it and your clients would not be getting the results they wanted. So you would make sure that your, your changes are backward compatible. The next step would be to upgrade all your servers and deploy those so that they all support the new features that you've added. 
And then at that time, it would be safe to start upgrading your clients because now any server that they connected to would have that new version supported. So does it work where the server will say, here are client versions that I will accept, here's a list of versions, or is it more dynamic where it says, I expected to get X, Y, and Z, and I see X, Y, and Z coming in, so I'm good. Right. Within gRPC, there's no versioning support natively or protobuf for that matter. So any kind of versioning you wanted to do, you would have to do that manually. There is sort of one exception to that, which is uh, it is good practice to use version numbers in your protobuf package names. And this allows you to essentially release a major version that breaks compatibility so you can delete fields and things at that time without impacting uh, any clients or servers using the previous major version. So that would be your route if you did want to break compatibility for whatever reason, you would do that through a major version change, which you do through the protobuf package name. But otherwise, there's no versions in gRPC. Messages will be serialized according to the version that the client has, and then they will be deserialized according to the server's version. And as long as all the fields that it thinks it needs are present, then it will you know, process the RPC. If this process goes horribly wrong, do I get an error message like deserialization failed, could not find value of X? Actually, no, I don't think that. So it could happen if you change the type of a field, for instance, you might get a type mismatch error. But if you deleted a field, actually what you would see is a unknown field. And the protobuf deserializer on the receiving side would see those fields and it would know their types, but it wouldn't expose them in a language native way, uh, except through like a reflection kind of interface. I want to move on and talk about comparison to REST. So in the REST world, you have the four HTTP methods, whereas gRPC, you have methods that you define. Is that really different or is it just slightly different way of looking at the same thing. Yeah, so REST has REST is like a very particular environment uh, where gRPC is really like a lower level building block conceptually. REST is more like a protocol itself. And so, so all of the operations in REST are essentially unary RPCs in the gRPC world. And so uh, when you compare the four different modes of gRPCs, RPCs, and the four different operations in REST, they're, they're kind of different things. Do you have any data on performance comparisons between gRPC and the HTTP and JSON-based systems? I don't know about that direct comparison. We do have on our website, grpc.io, we do have benchmarks that we uh, maintain. But a lot of these things are actually going to be application specific. And so we have, you know, what we think are representative benchmarks. But, you know, obviously, at the end of the day, you'll want to, you know, test these things out for yourself. Let's talk about the benchmarks. Can you give me any uh, example of a benchmark? that has been done and what was learned? So our typical benchmarks are a little bit more micro benchmark focused. So we have uh, benchmarks that are intended to stress the latency of, of a single operation. So we put no load in the system and we see how fast can we send a single request and get a response back all the way through a gRPC client and server application stack. Then we have ones that just try to maximize throughput and how many bytes can we push through this thing if we open up you know, lots of connections and do lots of streams on each one. And then we also have a QPS one, which is similar, but instead of sending large messages, it sends as small messages as it can to see how many raw messages per second we can handle. So Doug, if you could look at some of the benchmarks that have been published, give me one that stands out to you or that looks interesting. Yeah, so looking at our uh, benchmark dashboard, I see QPS benchmark, which is queries per second that are able to be handled by a single VM. This is running in GCE, Google Compute Engine. And uh, it looks like I'm seeing about 750,000 for the Java client. 
So that's 750,000 RPCs happening every second. Do you have an idea how it compares to the JSON or HTTP? Yeah, we don't have we don't have direct comparisons there. Sorry. Okay. All right. So moving on a little bit more about building a system on top of gRPC. There are different ways that microservices can communicate. If you think of an RPC as something that blocks, and if you're going three levels deep, do you want everything to block based on the deepest layer versus queuing where I just dump something on a queue and then come back and say, I did the thing you want, and then it happens later. But with async programming models and multi-threading, it seems like maybe you can really decouple everything while using gRPC. So are, are those two models really different, or can you dis- determine how synchronous or how much blocking you want entirely in the gRPC stack? Yeah, so there's a lot of different ways to uh, go about this kind of problem. Uh, So if you have a very long-running RPC, you may choose to actually make that an RPC that essentially sends a callback. So you would, as a client, maybe start a process off with the server, but maybe that process is going to take an hour to complete on the server. So in that case, if you have the client sitting there waiting an hour for this thing to happen and the network dies in the middle. Now, if the only way the server could send the result back to the client was through that connection, then you've just lost it. And now potentially you've lost an hour worth of work along with it. So typically for things like that, that are very long running, we would recommend a different type of architecture that for that than just a single RPC. So one thing you might reach for here is a pub sub service where the client, instead of making an RPC to a server to say, here's my request, it instead publishes a message to a pub sub service, potentially also over RPC. The servers then are able to receive those out of the pub sub queue, process them, and push their results back. And now the client can be monitoring that uh, message queue that the results come back on in order to find its results. We talked about the gRPC. It could conceivably be used to support a PubSub model if I'm building a system and I know I want PubSub as part of the system. Would I reach for gRPC or are there other tools that are better for that? And that's not really what it's competitive at. I think gRPC is an excellent choice for a PubSub type model. The streaming RPC mode that it has is essentially perfect for PubSub. So the client's able to subscribe, and then as updates happen asynchronously, it will uh, receive those off of the stream. So it can be a really big part of your distributed system infrastructure. If not a one-stop shop, it does quite a lot, potentially could do quite a lot for you as just one piece of infrastructure. Uh, Very much so. So yeah, it is utilized very, very heavily at Google. You know, we don't use gRPC as much because we already had Stubby in place and such a migration is a huge task. But yeah, for for everything we do at Google almost, it's RPCs the whole way down. I think I maybe got stuck a little bit on the historical idea of procedure call, which is old school is a really different thing from pub sub. But if I just forget what the letters stand for and try to think about what it does, it can do quite a lot. For sure. Okay. Does the gRPC language specific libraries, do they play well with distributed tracing? Yeah, so we do have uh, support built into all of the uh, implementations of gRPC to allow tracing tools to hook in and do what they need to do. And so typically what that is, is at the start of RPCs, they will add some kind of a tag into the RPC headers. And then on the receiving side, those tags will be received. Uh, Now your monitoring can can pick those up. Uh, In addition, as your services get more and more complicated, they're built out of many, many pieces. So to handle a single request from a sort of user client, you might have a service that makes requests to other services and so on and so forth down the chain. 
And at every level, we will propagate these tags and be able to consolidate them so you can trace the entire flow of an RPC through the system. Where are we in the adoption curve? Who's using this? How popular is it? I think it's still growing a lot right now, uh, but it is also very widely used already. So obviously, you know, Google is built entirely on this already. And as we look more and more into what uh, smaller startups are doing, from the start, they are adopting this design philosophy we see. You mentioned it has been open sourced and are all of the community versions of different languages all open source? Yeah, so all of all of the languages that I mentioned before are all open source, uh, and you can find them all at the uh, gRPC GitHub page. Do you have a view on, do you see JavaScript becoming more on par with these other languages and the ability to invoke gRPC from browsers? I don't really have any uh, specific insights into that, actually. So I think what that would require is really good uh, HTTP2 library support in a uh, browser. And this will be my last question. Is this pretty much mature technology? It does what it does? Or do you see big changes in the pipeline over the next couple of years? Yes, it's, it's definitely a very mature technology. We've been uh, GA general availability for like two or three years now. And so, you know, it should be rock solid. It's well tested. It's widely adopted in the community. There's a lot of changes in the pipeline, but not at the sort of RPC message level. These are more at the microservice management level. And so you, you look out and you see what people are doing while they're, they're building hundreds and hundreds of different uh, microservices. And now the problem becomes, how do you deploy these things in the cloud? How do you manage all of these? How do you make sure they upgrade together? How do they discover one another? All of that. And so a lot of the changes that are coming up are related to that. So you have projects like Istio and Envoy for helping to facilitate the communication between these microservices. And then something that we're doing now in gRPC itself is uh, essentially incorporating parts of the Envoy proxy that is part of that and part of enabling uh, your service mesh to really get going. We're incorporating these pieces into gRPC so that users don't have to manage extra pieces of infrastructure like the Envoy proxy that would otherwise need to be, you know, it's one more application that you need to manage the lifecycle of. So we're building some of that support straight into gRPC. Is there anything about gRPC that you think is important that we haven't covered? I think the biggest parts of gRPC that are the most complicated bits that we didn't really touch on are related to what I was just mentioning and how do you, you discover the services that you're trying to talk to and then how do you manage the traffic to those backends so for instance what kind of load balancing are you doing to make sure that your you know your clients are are behaving well in terms of putting load on the servers and so you know that's probably another hour long conversation there but yeah otherwise i think we covered all the all the basics about uh, making rpcs Listeners would like to find you or see what you're up to. Where should they go? So the gRPC project, uh, our website I mentioned before is grpc.io. Our GitHub page is github.com slash grpc. I mainly work on the Go project. And so if you're interested in Go, that's uh, grpc slash grpc Go on GitHub. And uh, yeah, feel free to look us up, send us an issue, ask us a question. Uh, we're always happy to help. But yeah, that's the best way to get in touch with me. Doug, thank you so much for speaking to Software Engineering Radio. Thank you so much for having me. This has been Robert Blumen. Thank you for listening. Thanks for listening to SE Radio, an educational program brought to you by IEEE Software Magazine. For more about the podcast, including other episodes, visit our website at se-radio.net. To provide feedback, you can comment on each episode on the website or reach us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, or through our Slack channel at seradio.slack.com. You can also email us at team at se-radio.net.
This and all other episodes of SE Radio is licensed under Creative Commons License 2.5. Thanks for listening.